Hi, In the Bag Sunday is happening on the, by the 17th is the deadline for that. So In the Bag means bring clothing for the Hope Center. We need men's jeans, lightweight coats, kids' clothing, 6 to 16, um, women's clothing, and ankle socks. So uh, please bring your bags full of your clothing that you want to donate and put them in the back. Okay, so as many people know, the Hope Center moved the last couple months, so they, they had held off taking donations because they didn't want to have to move them a block away. But now that they're in the new location, uh, they, could, they could desperately use donations because they didn't take it for, for, month, for a couple months there. So uh, other announcements. You'll notice that we were planning on having the uh, indoor cleanup on March 2nd. That plan has changed. We're not having that now. I'm not exactly sure what's happening with that, other than I think just various groups. Linda, can you speak to that? You yes, I can. Uh, we're looking for sort of team captains to identify areas, and then we'll gather the chicks around the queen captain, and they can decide what day they want to scurry the dust cobwebs out of the corners, whether it's the coat room, the pantry, the Sunday school wing. So it's Dave Christensen who is chairing this new system. If you see something where you think that could be a blessing for you to offer our church, he's the one to see, and it's on your timeline. All right. All right, as you're settling down, if I can have the children come on forward, and we're going to go to a, a live arm out of the bullpen today. So, uh, Mr. Tammy, take it away. You guys want to come on up? Yeah, if I, if I could get uh, the youth to help me. We're going to do a construction project today, so I um, need a little help with this. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be building a wall. It's going to be built on the table. And it's going to be, there's no really right or wrong to it, but I'd like you to help if you can do that. It'll be something like this. Um, and then just put them on top. There's no right or wrong. They're different size ones. Great job. Um, walls are, are different and, and they have different uses. Sometimes uh, they're very helpful. What are some of the re ways a wall could be helpful for you? Keep you warm. Keep you warm. Protect you from like rain. Protect from rain, from somebody you know, from maybe making your life a little safer. Um, how can walls be not so good? Uh, how can they have a negative effect on you? They could break. Yes, they could break. Uh, they might need repair. What also do, do walls do when, when you're here and if there's a wall here, what, what can that do? It can separate us. Yes, it can. Um, sometimes it's necessary, too, with a wall to uh, reach over to help someone. Is, is that the case sometimes? How, you know, from your experience, uh, the two of you do, I think, this all the time. How does this church reach across the wall and, and help people? Do you, like, Habitat for Humanity stuff? Do you like fundraisers, I guess? Fundraisers? Do you know? No. Okay. Uh, 
every week you, uh, some of you grab that, that bucket and, and what do you do with it? Use it for food for food pantries? Yes, yeah, so that's one way the church supports um, reaching over a wall. Um, but sometimes, uh, as you said, walls don't necessarily uh, work the way they should. Uh, sometimes they have to be rebuilt. You have to take parts out. Um, and why would that happen? I, I think you mentioned that. There could be some sort of a disaster. There could be a storm. There could be a war that causes that. And one way our, we do it as a church as a whole is, is to do it through one great hour of sharing. Um, uh, Presbyterian disaster assistance <laughs> is, is one of the programs we have where we're supportive uh, when disasters happen, whether it's a war, whether it's a natural disaster, uh, or whether something else. Um, sometimes we have to rebuild, not only rebuild, uh, but sometimes we have to remove walls too, um, because sometimes walls get in the way of injustice. Uh, or justice for people. Um, and, this, uh, and, and again, that's also part of what we do with one great hour of sharing. It's, it's sort of the program we've had for 75 years in the church. And for example, the self-development of people is one way that we help rebuild walls too, um, and strengthen and reach across walls uh, to help people. Same with the, the Presbyterian Hunger Program. That's another aspect of it. Um, so these are ways that we, through a church, work together uh, with other churches and with ourselves to help other people to, to deal with walls, to build walls, to take them down, um, to modify. Dear God, help us to love one another and spread love to one another through help, uh, through this church, through Presbyterian disaster assistance, through, through um, uh, self-development of people, and everything else that one great air, hour of sharing does for us. Thank you, God. Amen. Our, our first uh, reading from the Old Testament today is from Genesis 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. One of the things that was really common in the ancient world was for people's names to mean something. Um, a lot of times today we just like a name and so we ch give our child that name, but a lot of times in the ancient world the name meant something. Let's take Abram for example. His name meant high father and Sarai's name meant my princess. Well, at some point God decided to change their names and he changed their names because of a covenant he was developing with them. So Ab Abram became Abraham, which meant father of a multitude, and Sarai became Sarah, which meant mother of nations. And you'll see why, of course, when you listen to the covenant that was given here. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you extremely numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you an ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to be your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, she, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, 
And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. That ends our first reading. First of all, thank you to Bruce for, for leading the conversation with the children this morning. Uh, the one great hour of sharing, we normally take that offering on Palm Sunday, which will be March 24th. You'll be hearing more about one great hour in the next couple weeks as we have uh, a variety of different speakers talking about it. Second reading for today, our gospel reading, comes from the gospel according to Mark, chapters thir or chapter 8, verses 31 through 38, and it's one of the traditional Lenten readings. Listen for God's word. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. <clears throat> he said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for, the, for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words, this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, I will give it to you truthfully. I am uncomfortable with the Jesus portrayed in this story. When I think of our Savior, and we've talked about this before, right? When you think of Jesus, what do you think of? And, and we could have a little quiz here right now, but we're not going to take the time. Some people would say, well, I think of Jesus on the cross. Some people would say, I think of the risen Christ. Uh, I think of, of the Jesus who taught and healed, who is compassionate and kind and giving and loving. But, but when I read this story, I don't see that. I see Jesus with an edge, not afraid to smack down his closest friend and supporter, right? Get behind me, Satan, right? If you said that to somebody in today's world, their, their eyes might get pretty wide, right? And that makes me uncomfortable, but it also probably makes Jesus fully human, right? We don't, we don't often see Jesus not in complete control, not in complete temperament. And here, I don't think that's the case. Makes Jesus fully human. The edgy Jesus at the end of Mark, chapter 8, this story brings up three remarkable theological ideas in just a short passage. Why do I call them remarkable? Because if I went to each of you and said, hey, do you think this is something that Jesus would have said? Odds are you would shake your head and said, yeah, I think I've heard that before. Right? What are, what are the three things? Embrace divine things, not human things. Those who try to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for Jesus and for the gospel will save it. And the third, deny oneself and take up the cross and follow. Hopefully we've all heard these three things before, right? They're, I mean, they're, this is read fairly often. But that's a lot to have in one passage. Each of these three ideas could, could be their own sermon, and honestly, they probably should be, but we don't have time for that. So many questions follow. What are human things? What are divine things? Who gets to decide what's human? What's divine? What does losing one's life in this context mean? What does it mean to, to lose your life for the sake of the gospel or the sake of Jesus? And, and what's wrong with trying to save one's life? 
What could be no more noble than, than trying to keep on existing? What does denying oneself look like? There are so many questions, and, and maybe that also leads to some of my discomfort. When I read a passage, and it's question after question after question, and not a whole lot of answers, I think that can bring discomfort. This is not really a story as much as it's just a straight teaching. But what is Jesus teaching, and, and what are we prepared to do to live into that teaching? We're going to come back to these questions in a bit. But first, a story. Earlier in this week, I, I hustled out of the men's breakfast on Wednesday morning pretty quick because I had to be back at church and ready to jump on a call at 9 a.m. My sister and mother were meeting with an attorney in Dearborn to start going through the process of settling Dan's estate. And so I zoomed in with them. We got a lot done in a short amount of time. We made some decisions and a plan outlined and considered many things in about an hour. And at one point, the lawyer brought up something that hadn't occurred to any of us. He was reading through the paperwork and he said, Dan died on October 1st? Yes. And he was in a care facility paying out of pocket? Yes, it was very expensive. He was paying a lot. Then he would have paid in advance for October. Yes, my mother replied. I have his bank statement here showing it. Then the facility owes the estate the bulk of the money for October because he died on the 1st. They probably will take a little out as a cleaning expense or whatever, but they owe you at least a few thousand dollars. I'll tell you, it was not easy sitting down with an attorney, going through my brother's will. If, if I haven't told you, Dan's will was from like two decades ago. The, the primary executor was my father, and, and he died 12 years ago. So we don't have a whole lot of help from the will. And finances were the one place that Dan still felt he had control in his life towards the end. It was where he had that one piece of dignity left, and so he protected that strongly. He left us with very little to go on. And, and even if he had left us with more, that's not what this is about. Even if he'd left us more prepared, it would still have been hard and exhausting settling my brother's estate. So one could argue that the meeting on Wednesday was about human things, making sure we followed the law and that we had everything in order and that we were smart about it and tried to limit the tax liability and get the money owed from the care facility and paying off the remaining medical bills and, and, and human things, right? I would say that there's nothing spiritual and nothing divine about tax codes and beneficiaries and probate. But these things all need to be considered. That's what part of living life is. Just because we call them human things doesn't mean their work doesn't need to be done. To say that we're focusing on divine things doesn't mean that we can drop everything else, right? I don't think I was focusing on divine things is a justifiable answer to the IRS, right? So where's the line between human things and divine things? Where's the difference? And who decides what's what? Because one of the striking things about the meeting, other than the grief mixed with a building confidence that settling the estate isn't going to last forever, even though it feels like it's taking an eternity, the competence and compassion and energy of the attorney was amazing to me. Our meeting was delayed, so I actually didn't need to rush out of breakfast because it didn't start actually about nine, until about 9.20 because the law firm had had a, a mix-up in their schedule. You see, last week, both the assistant and the attorney were out sick, <clears throat> and one thing got on the calendar and didn't get on the other calendar. There was a miscommunication. Anyways, at 9 o'clock when the assistant said, yeah, the, the, uh, the Holmes and Boltons are here to see you, the lawyer wasn't at the office because he didn't think he had a meeting that morning. 
So he had to hustle in to meet with us. But when he did arrive, he was great. He had expertise and compassion and wisdom. And I may see that meeting as human things, but he might see helping the family navigate the waters of estate law <clears throat> and finance after the death of a loved one. He might see that as a divine thing, helping a family through a difficult time as a way that he helps make the world better. I don't know. I, I didn't ask him this, but I could see someone in his position possibly thinking that. So to fully understand, or at least understand even glancingly divine things, human things, denying oneself, picking up one's cross, and losing or gaining one's life, to have an appreciation for all of this passage, we need to look at the beginning of it. What gets Jesus fired up in the first place? All of this can be illuminated by the beginning. Jesus is trying to teach the disciples of what's to come, of the cross. That the rest of his life on earth isn't going to be one of power, but one of suffering. And Peter takes umbrage with that. Now, we don't know exactly what was said, and we wouldn't understand it anyways, because they were speaking Aramaic. But it's clear Peter is not accepting probably not even listening to what Jesus is trying to tell the disciples. And Jesus gets irate and he smacks him down verbally. Get behind me, Satan. Focus on divine things, not on human things. The word that we're looking for is conflict. There's conflict here. This whole story and, and substantial teaching within, they're rooted in conflict. Peter thinking one thing, Jesus telling him, no, it's going to be the other thing. And that's okay. We each face conflict in our lives. Hopefully not in a sense of physical conflict. But no friendship or relationship or workplace or community or church is free of conflict. And that's a good thing, actually, because out of conflict can come growth. To expect to always live conflict-free, it's like living in a stagnant pond with no movement or freedom or growth or change. And that's no way to live. It's also impossible to live that way. It cannot be done. So out of conflict comes growth. In this passage, out of conflict comes profound wisdom. One thing to catch in Jesus' teaching is the call to take up one's cross and follow. Notice he doesn't say, take up my cross, or, or take up a cross, or take up Don's cross. We're to take up our own cross. I was thinking of this this week as I was preparing for confirmation this morning. The goal of confirmation, it's not to mold Sydney and, and Lily into their, not to mold their faith into my faith. The goal of confirmation is not to mold Lily's faith into her mother or father or grandmother's faith or the faith of JPC, or the faith of the elders, or the faith of the PCOSA. You get the idea. The goal of confirmation is to set these two young women on the path of becoming the best, most authentic person of faith that they can be. Not taking faith from somebody else, but growing their own faith. For surely their faith, just as their lives, will be different than any of our lives and any of our faith. We're each wonderfully and uniquely made. Why would we want to copy our faith off of someone else? So we're each to pick up our own cross. To be the best person of faith that we can be. In that way, I believe that our human things are made into divine things. 
by pe being people of grace and compassion, justice and love. I think of it in, in Bruce's wonderful conversation. Sometimes we need walls and sometimes we need to reach past walls. And a mature faith is knowing when is when. So each year, Lent is a series of, it's a season of opportunity, of reevaluating, of reassessing where we have been as a people of faith and, and what we need to change, if anything, going forward. The season before Easter is a time to take stock of where we are and adjust accordingly. Now, this is a task not just for our confirmands, but for all of us. We are always growing and changing in faith. Lent is just a season where we are urged to be more cognizant of that. Yesterday was our presbytery meeting, our quarterly presbytery meeting. We were down in Lake Geneva at the Lynn Church. And if you've never been to a presbytery meeting, we have a little business and then we have a teaching moment where we, where we hear from someone and then we have lunch and then we have worship. And, and yesterday when it came time for the teaching segment, the three people who were there from our church, myself and elders Dave Carr and Jerry Kapinski, uh, the three of us each actually went to a different place. So Dave Carr had his annual clerk review where he had brought the minutes for the stated clerk to read them over. He went and did that. Jerry stayed in the main part of the meeting because they were hearing from Habitat for Humanity, was asked to come in and speak about their, their mission to ministry. And afterwards, I ran into Jerry, and Jerry was taking photos around the church because Lynn does a great job of like doing physical representations of their mission work. So for Habitat and for Heifer International and, and whatnot, so, for, so on and so forth, they have displays around so people can, can more appreciate not just hearing about it, but seeing it. And they also had a call for anybody who wanted to jump into the choir singing at worship. And so I went on down the hall, and it was actually the Heritage Church leading worship. And I quickly learned two songs, got to sing each twice through before worship. And I will say it was both exhilarating and the most challenging musical thing I'd done in a while here's this piece of music, you get to sing it twice, get out there and sing. But yesterday I, I saw all the different ways we can change. I saw friends that I hadn't seen in a long time, both because of my foot and then before that because of COVID. Uh, I ran into the pastor of Rock Prairie, Bruce Jones, and I was like, Bruce, when was the last time we actually saw each other in person? And Bruce is like, it's probably three or four years at this point. And it was good to connect with old friends and old colleagues. And it was good to use the talents to be able to sing and to be challenged by that. And Jerry was challenged of how can we reflect the mission that we do here with that. So taking stock of where our faith is can be any number of things this is one of those challenging sermons for me to preach where I can't tell you, I can't tell Sue what Sue needs to work on. I can't tell Dean what Dean needs to work on in your faith. Only you guys can answer that for yourselves. Only each of us can answer that for ourselves. I, I can articulate what Andy Holmes, I think, needs to work on in growing my faith. But that doesn't help every person. And so I'm always reminded of the Thomas Merton quote from a hundred years ago now, where he wrote, Lord, I don't know how to please you sometimes, but I believe that in me wanting to please you, pleases you. For me, that's what Lent is. I don't exactly know how to please God, how to become better in my faith, how to work through this. But I think if we're each earnest in that, if we want to focus on the divine things, if we want to take up our cross, 
I believe that gets us closer to God. To God be the glory. Amen. Let us offer our prayers to God. Let us pray. Wonderful God, we are grateful for the ability to call on you to bring our joys, to bring our concerns, to bring our whole selves. So we pray prayers of gratitude for Phyllis's recovery so far from her surgery, but ask that you continue to walk with her and, and walk with Shirley and Becky and everyone that, that Marilyn has mentioned, but all, all of our friends and loved ones who are, who are struggling right now. We ask for, for medical, medical attention and care and compassion for all of them and, and be with all of us also who are caregivers who are grateful for the gift of music and the gift of sunshine, the gifts of friendship, the gifts of birthdays. We're grateful for everyone who's celebrating a birthday this week and for any anniversaries and for just times of celebrating with each other. We are grateful for those moments in our lives. We're grateful for the opportunity to, to reconnect with loved ones and to stay connected. We pray this day for your whole world. We, we pray not just selfishly for the things in our lives, but we pray for your whole creation, for those in war-torn lands that they may find peace, for those in pressed, oppressed lands that they may find freedom. And we ask for peace and freedom to dwell within our hearts this day as well. We pray for your church, for all the churches around us that carry out your word, for all Christians around the world who are your hands in this world. We pray this day for all the prayers that have been spoken out loud by myself and by others and the prayers that are deepest within inside of us. For we know that you see truly what we care about, what we hand over to you, even in silence, especially in silence. We pray all of this in the precious and yet so powerful name of Jesus Christ, who taught disciples of all nations to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord leads us in the dance of life. But it's not a dance we do by ourselves, right? We are called to be people of compassion and justice, mercy and forgiveness. Every day, all day, for our whole lives. So friends... May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and all those whom you love, and all those whom God calls you to love, from now until our Lord comes again in glory. Amen. Amen.